This video was made possible by my Diamond Level Patron, Nissa Phillips. You can commission your very own video over on my Patreon. Thank you to my Asbantium Level Patron, Fallon Cortez, for helping to support the channel. Watership Down is a crime against humanity. Richard Adams was a truly twisted man who also wrote Plague Dogs, showing just how much he despises animals and children all around the world. Seriously, who decided that Watership Down would be a good fit for little kids to read, let alone watch, is what some people might say. Because yes, in 1978, Martin Rosen decided to adapt this traumatic piece of fiction into a movie. A U-rated movie. You know, suitable for all. Stuff like Finding Nemo or Toy Story. But Watership Down is more like Finding Nemo if they all died and got graphically torn to shreds by sharks along the way. And if you think I'm joking, just look at its 44 year journey to finally get a PG classification in 2022. But yeah, it's probably just all those snowflakes these days, am I right? Well, how about we actually take a dive into possibly one of the most traumatising pieces of children's media and see whether it's worthy of such a grim reputation. Or whether all those 70s critics were right all along about it being suitable for kids to watch. Obviously, content warning for animated animals getting mutilated and killed. So yeah, if you're a big animal lover like me, tread carefully. Part 1. Spiritual Rabbits Right from the beginning, Watership Down introduces a strong backbone of spirituality and mythology. In a really surreal opening, we're shown the creation story of the Earth being made and populated by Frith, the sun god worshipped by the rabbits. It's animated really well and kind of looks like a picture book. Part of the reason this sequence stands out so much is because it was designed by John Hubley, who was the initial director until he left after disagreements with the producer. However, I think the stark difference adds a lot of depth to the universe of the film. It's so dramatically unlike the rest of the movie that it sets itself apart with striking visuals. It's all exposition of course, but it's delivered in this unique and memorable way, effortlessly establishing an entire history and belief system for these quaint little animals. The rabbits believe that Frith blessed them with life, but the prince of the rabbits was stubborn and refused to keep his species under control. So, to teach them a lesson, Frith created vicious predators to hunt the rabbits, although he then buffed the bunnies in the next balance patch. It's such a fascinating backstory, providing rabbits with all these skills to survive, and it's fitting that their creation story would keep the rabbits at the centre of everything because, after all, it is their mythology. This core theme of spiritualism is furthered with a mysterious black rabbit, the grim reaper who takes rabbits away upon their deaths. I find it so interesting how the black rabbit is never definitively explained as being a good thing or a bad thing. On one hand, it's sad for these rabbits to live in fear of the black rabbit, but on the other hand, it would be comforting to know that you're being shepherded into the afterlife. Indeed, the Black Rabbit is merely carrying out the command of Lord Frith himself, so the dual perspectives are an interesting view of death itself. The 2018 miniseries elaborates on this in a fascinating way, with a scene of the injured Hazel talking to the Black Rabbit. She reveals that, to her at least, life is the absence of death. They're always walking with her except for that brief period where they're alive. It's a striking perspective on death itself and it feels very fitting for the themes of the wider narrative. Even in this original adaptation, death is seen as something common and it's a plain fact of life, for lack of a better word. It's like when the rabbits think that Bigwig has died. They simply accept it and say, My heart has joined the thousand, for my friend stopped, stopped running, running today. today. Stating that he stopped running doesn't necessarily mean they're talking about him being dead now permanently, it just means that he's instead walking with a black rabbit once more. To again draw from that 2018 miniseries, the black rabbit describes death as being like the seasons changing. It's nothing to fear and instead something to embrace, which is what we see Hazel doing at the end of the movie. And yes. Let's talk about Hazel, who lives in a peaceful and beautiful rabbit warren with his younger brother Fiverr, who is a lot smaller and gets shunned by some of his peers for being a runt. He almost relies on Hazel for physical security and safety because he can't look after himself. 
However, if there was anything to learn from the biblical opening, it's that rabbits have more gifts than meet the eye. What Fiver lacks in courage and physical strength, he more than makes up for with his determination and his abilities to sense things the others cannot. Right from the beginning, he feels a sense of foreboding danger, somehow knowing the destruction to come. There are many religious stories throughout the world that use visions and premonitions of the future. So Fiverr being almost like this prophet with these characteristics and powers throughout the narrative, continue to build this sense of mysticality. It's thanks to his chilling vision of the Warren being destroyed that he and Hazel were able to escape before the premonition comes to pass. As a seer, Five is an invaluable member of the group, despite some of his fellow rabbits sometimes accusing him of being mad. But it's the combination of his foresight and Hazel's leadership that helps the group thrive. Despite all the religious subtext and spiritualism within the story of Warship Down, there's no out and out Jesus-like figure. However, main character Hazel does often feel a lot like Moses, guiding his people through trials and tribulations before settling and thriving. Hazel is a wonderful character voiced by the even more wonderful John Hurt. And I love this character, he's such a good bunny. Hazel is brave, intelligent and caring, always putting others before himself. During the climax of the movie, he even tries to make a bargain with Frith to sacrifice his own life to save those of his Warren, showing the pure selflessness of the character. He's just that desperate to protect the ones he cares about. It's interesting how, despite the commanding presence of Bigwig, it's Hazel who naturally develops into being the chief of Watership Down. Right from the beginning, the group listens to him and he acts with growing authority. However, he does make sure to heed the counsel of the group at large, avoiding the same mistakes of his own former chief, because this group instead feels more like a democracy. Hazel's character arc is very well executed because he doesn't just immediately become a respected leader. There's a flashpoint early on where some of the rabbits begin to doubt their decision to leave and wonder if Fiverr was actually wrong. Hazel struggles to hold them all together, and it's only the appearance of Cowslip that stops tensions boiling over, because it distracts them from the seeming lack of a destination. However, it's all of the challenges that make Hazel's leadership abilities grow as he understands the importance of making difficult decisions. He assumes a lot of responsibility as the last to sleep and the first to wake. His loyalty to his friends is admirable since the threat of death is constantly looming, but he keeps pushing forward despite his own exhaustion and fears. As the film goes on, we see him go from strength to strength, growing into a confident leader who inspires everyone around him. He he really becomes a legendary figure who understands the need for strategy and cunning, which gives him the edge over predators big and small. Hazel steps up to the task as leader, not because he has some divine right or epic destiny, but just because it's the right thing to do. And he gets rewarded for that by his god. After all the running and fighting, Hazel's group is finally able to settle down and thrive on Watership Down. It's really emotional as an elderly Hazel is visited by Ella Herrera himself, who reassures Hazel that his work is done and he no longer has to worry about his warren, so Hazel can finally let go and walk with the Black Rabbit. It shows that willingness to accept and embrace death, because it isn't a bad thing. Like I discussed earlier, it's bittersweet but the perfect ending for such a spiritual story, showing how life doesn't really end with death. Part 2 – Realistic Rabbits Watership Down had a large animation team, despite it ending up looking pretty simple and basic by today's standards. However, there's something endearing and charming about the animation style because of this simplicity. It always reminds you of the quaintness and small scale of the narrative when you really think about it. Because this is such a contained story which has absolutely zero bearing on the wider world, apart from the rabbits annoying some farmers at one point. And I'm sure because of causality that one of these farmers ended up, I don't know, becoming becoming a fascist leader or something, I don't know, it's a crazy world. But because the movie is presented through the lens of little rabbits, everything suddenly feels much bigger. I think this comes across clearly as Hazel's group finally reaches Watership Down and they celebrate being able to see the entire world. To us as human viewers, we just see some fields and think, yeah, that's a pretty nice view. But to the rabbits, it literally is their entire world because they'll never go beyond those fields and have no reason to believe there's anything there. It puts everything into perspective and makes things feel more realistic within the natural setting. 
This even comes across in the way the rabbits themselves move. Again, it seems low budget and a bit janky, but in a way I think that actually lends a bit more characterisation to them. They feel like actual animals with unique movements like sniffing the air or using their paws to test structural integrity or warn their friends of danger. It shows that you don't need everything to look ultra realistic to feel ultra realistic. I mean, just look at that Lion King movie they made a couple of years ago. Yeah, it sucked because they tried to make it all look real. Although, in terms of Watership Down, there are a number of times where it is hard to tell the protagonists apart because some of them do look too similar, being just rabbits after all. But that's only a minor issue. It's immediately redeemed through the characterizations and the interesting ways of communication between rabbits. They don't exactly speak like a human would. Their mouths don't always move, which maintains that sense of them being animals, whilst also allowing their human voice actors to humanise them. Richard Adams even created the Lapine language for his rabbit characters, so it further deepens the world and the rabbit society to hear them referring to foxes as hombas, because it feels like we're simply glimpsing into this detailed world and it makes everything feel unique and real, because they don't necessarily conform to how we perceive the world ourselves. Fiverr's ominous premonition is actually of their warren being destroyed and turned into housing, which obviously the rabbits don't exactly know or understand, but this plot element shines a light on the environmental damage humans cause without thinking twice. It's a good way to show our complicated relationship with nature. Having this be like an apocalyptic thing for rabbits is surprisingly realistic for how it vilifies humans for destroying nature. We're constantly building and mining without once considering how much wildlife and how many habitats we're destroying. Watership Down doesn't shy away from showing the extent of this destruction, how the animals are displaced or outright killed. It's truly horrifying to think of what happens to the Sandalford Warren, let alone see it in detail. Captain Holly's flashback is disturbing and I think it needs to be to get its point across. These are the rabbits we met at the beginning, having such cute fun times just eating grass and carrots and stuff, you know, just existing, not harming anyone. But then the humans come along and seal them into their own burrows and gas them to death simply because their habitat happens to be somewhere inconvenient for humans, even though, you know, the rabbits were there first. In the real world, we see rabbits and animals and dismiss them as simple creatures without much sentience, so we tend to just kill them without thought because, you know, gotta have a new building there. But Watership Down twists this perspective and shows you how the rabbits really feel about their lives constantly being under threat because of humanity's own rapid overpopulation issues, which I guess is kind of ironic given that rabbits are the ones usually stereotyped for breeding too much. And unlike the rabbits mythology, there isn't exactly a clear and present god hanging around ready to nerf us. They'll never rest until they've spoiled the earth. Having escaped their safe and peaceful home, the small band of rabbits have to journey through the woods, where every little sound and movement terrifies them. It continues to put their small size into perspective, because they're prey for almost everything, even other rabbits. I think this very non-fluffy approach is necessary for the story. It's not just gratuitous. Wardship Down doesn't shy away from the realistic brutality of nature in our own world. Just because rabbits are cute and, well, fluffy, doesn't mean that they don't get routinely hunted by hawks and ripped apart by all different kinds of canines. You know, a wild dog isn't just gonna go, oh that rabbit looks really cute, I'm not gonna eat Eat it. Part of me appreciates that the film pulls no punches when it comes to hurting its adorable little bunnies. You know, I wrote my half-joking introduction before I even watched the movie, but when I got around to it I wasn't even all that shocked or outraged by what I saw. It's simply the same honesty of nature documentaries, where you see prey being caught, just like Violet being killed by a hawk just because she happens to leave safety for a few seconds. It's as The Lion King famously states, it's the circle of life. This stuff happens in the real world all the time, and not every piece of animal fiction can be romanticised where they all live happily ever after and nothing ever goes wrong. We even see a hedgehog splattered on the floor, because yeah, that's just life. As I stated in the introduction of this video, this film does have a reputation for its violence, but like I said, I don't actually think it's too egregious or upsetting. The blood is never gratuitous and it only ever serves the story, to show how violent these things are. Watership Down's treatment of its rabbits is probably less traumatic to a child than Mr. Tickles the tabby cat coming in through the cat flap with a dead rabbit in its mouth. That is definitely going to scar a child a lot more than seeing some animated stills getting a little bit bloody. And anyway, it could be a lot worse. It could be fucking plague dogs. 
Part 3 Political Rabbits A big aspect of Watership Down is its political storytelling. Right from the beginning, we meet the chief rabbit of Sandalford, who is this big, old and lazy rabbit who almost feels like a neglectful monarch. He's grown so fat off the land that he refuses to entertain the mere thought of danger. As a leader, he has become complacent and relies on his police force to do everything for him, whilst he just remains in his burrow all day, growing larger and more selfish. He doesn't even remember the names of his subjects because he's become detached from reality and the world outside. I find it interesting how many more members are part of Hazel initial group, but the majority are forced to stay by the Owsler, who initially seem like a powerful, oppressive police force, although we later find out they could be a lot worse. The frantic escape from the Owsler almost feels like a mini revolution, since it's only because of the group's strength in numbers that they're able to chase Captain Holly away before escaping the Warren for good. It's interesting how the political villains scale up in the narrative, starting with this lazy monarchy which still has a sense of freedom, before eventually ending with the full-blown dictatorship of General Woundwork. But in between is the full storm of Cowslip's Warren. It seems like a safe paradise with plenty of burrows and a regular supply of food. However, right from the beginning, Fiverr knows there's something wrong. Kelsip's group is cowardly and scheming, willing to let others die to prolong their own lives. That's why he's so eager for Hazel's group to join, and why he seems to lament how few there are in the group. Because the more rabbits in his warren, the higher his own chances of survival are, as the farmers regularly snare rabbits from the warren. I think there's an argument that could be made about Kelsip's warren being a representation of communism. There is no chief, they all have equal standing, and they even even have a uniform look. To outsiders, they seem to be prospering with good food and a strong community, but it's all a lie, propaganda to lure others in. On an extreme level, their refusal to acknowledge dead rabbits is similar to the infamous Soviet tactic of erasing people from history. It's almost like Kalsip's Warren represents communism, whilst Woundworks is fascist, with Hazel's some kind of utopian centre with perfect democracy. Is it a bit idealistic? Of course it is, but this isn't exactly Animal Farm. Indeed, Hazel's group comes across their idyllic paradise, the titular Watership Down, a huge hill which is one of the highest points in all of Hampshire. I think there's something special about what the hill represents to the rabbits. It's literally a utopia for them. It's a powerful vantage point most predators would struggle to climb. There's plenty of hill to burrow into and create a vast network of tunnels. It's literally the perfect home for them, and I think it holds symbolic value too. We all have our own Watership Down in our heads, the perfect paradise or home. Somewhere where everything is exactly how we want it to be. But this movie shows that it doesn't just have to be a dream. If you work hard enough and push yourself through fear and trepidation, you can make it to that place or state of mind. The group had to keep ploughing on through all that danger, so their settlement on Watership Down feels truly earned. It's representative of that political idealism that there is a perfect utopia where everything works well for everyone. You know, you just have to tidy up the fascist next door first. Yes, the main villains of the story are the vicious rabbits known as the Ephraphans, who are a brutal totalitarian empire. General Woundwork rules through fear and oppression, with strict curfews and extreme punishments. He forces obedience, and his subjects are terrified of him and his military presence. His police force constantly patrols, and there's even the implication that his officers are entitled to any dough they choose, regardless of whether she actually wants it or not. Bigwig's brave infiltration of the Ephraphan Warren gives us a window into the true oppression of this society, including a mysterious council which hands out brutal punishments to anyone who tries to escape. The fear of punishment is so strong that Heisenflee doesn't even trust Bigwig at the start because she's so afraid of being hurt by the council. It helps to illustrate why it's so hard for people to simply overthrow leaders like Woundwork. There's so much mistrust and paranoia that it's impossible to form any sort of real resistance group or movement. The morale is so low and people's spirits crushed that they don't want to even try escaping because they're so certain and they'll fail. The establishment of Woundwa as a villain perfectly marries the themes of politics and realistic nature, because animals are always fighting one another for land and power. Territorial disputes are often common among rabbits, and as the factual documentary Monty Python and the Holy Grail shows us, rabbits can be vicious little creatures. So the brutal inter-rabbit violence is a nice and simple direction for things to take. The free and independent rabbits of Hazel's group trying to overcome the imperialistic nature of Woundwa's growing warren as it sweeps 
leaps through others, assimilating some rabbits and just outright killing the rest. And even after Bigwig saves a number of dissenters, it isn't long before Woundworks forces catch up and start besieging Watership Down. The film has already established how merciless and militaristic the Ephrathans are. They're brutal and clinical, so you know the risks of being caught by them, something we see as Woundwork easily kills Blackavar without even breaking a sweat. They're terrifying antagonists with no clear weakness. However, much like the beginning shows, a rabbit's true strength is in its cunning, with a speed of gift and strategy. Everything comes full circle as Hazel unleashes a dog on Woundwork's forces. The dictator thought he could control everything through fear and power, but power doesn't panic, so it's almost ironic that his own army flees out of fear of the power of the dog. That's how he loses the battle, although the film keeps his ultimate fate ambiguous. I do like how he becomes mythological in his own right, becoming a scary bedtime story to intimidate young rabbits into behaving. It shows the impact he has had on wider rabbit society due to his brutal regime, and it also showcases how these stories all begin somewhere, once again circling round to the spiritual aspects of the story. I wasn't alive when Watership Down came out, I was about minus 21 years old, but I never even watched it as a child, so going into this video I had no sense of nostalgia towards it. And yet, watching it somehow felt like I was coming home. It really made me feel nostalgic for something I had never even experienced before. I think a big part of this is because of the whimsical and homely soundtrack, which perfectly complements the visuals of the beautiful British countryside. The true power of Watership Down is its simplicity. Obviously there are all these grand themes of spirituality and political power struggles, but at its core, it's a very simple narrative about nature, and embracing change. It's a beautiful story that works so well because of its honest brutality. On a basic level, it's a movie about a bunch of rabbits fleeing their warren and heading out into the dangerous world, where they make new friends and then live happily ever after. That doesn't sound like a particularly traumatising experience at all, but the devil and the trauma is in the details. It's a glimpse into the realism of our own countryside, where rabbits roam and fight for survival. The voice acting lends a really believable characterisation to all the protagonists, and I do think the criticisms of the violence are dramatically over exaggerated. Is it a bit dark for kids? Sure. But children need to learn about these things at some point, and Watership Down is a good way to teach those life lessons. Because who needs minions when you can have rabbit politics and bunny Moses? Although the most interesting thing about it all is that Richard Adams actually just wanted to write rabbit stories. All the politics and spirituality was just kind of an accident. So I guess this whole video was about nothing then? Huh. I guess that sums me up, doesn't it? And an extra special thank you to my Asbantium level patron, Fallon Cortez, my Platinum level patrons, Maximilian Foreman, and Nix Games, and all of my Gold level patrons, Calvin, Daniel Shilato, Franzorn AK Lion Vortex, Gog Nogler, Herna Verzog, Luke underscore SY, and Tifa Simp. Thank you all so much for your support.